Am I? There we go. Okay, so um, I think people uh, may be familiar with my book, and I also have an online course. I've just made a little discount coupon for people who are on the call here uh, for the next um, day or so. Uh, so if you want to sign up, if you haven't done, I'm going to rattle through quite a lot of stuff very quickly. We haven't got a huge amount of time now. Um, obviously, my course is much more in depth. So uh, just to let you know that. Um, Right. So we know that normal healthy cells can tolerate periods of fasting and a reduced access to nutrients. Cancer cells, on the other hand, cannot. They always need lots of fuel because it's a, a process of needing lots of ATP, that currency of energy for creating those daughter cells. And as Dr. Chi Van Dang says, cancer cells are addicted to nutrients. When they cannot consume enough, they just wither and die. So my approach was to use my four pillars, which um, obviously included a low GI diet. Um, I did exercise quite intensively, and I think uh, a lot of people don't use this enough. I think there's very good evidence to show that it is uh, incredibly useful, maybe reduces uh, metastases up to about 50 percent. I did use quite a lot of supplements um, and I also uh, eventually at the end, I used these off label drugs as well. And I have this approach to cancer that um, it's a little bit like looking down from uh, an eagle eye, looking down on Piccadilly Circus. Traditional approach is to assume that cancer is just a bunch of genetic mutations. So if you're looking down here, you can kind of see the main avenues into Piccadilly Circus and lots of people milling about. But this is a little like the P53 gene, which was discovered back in the 1950s. And this then became the big thing that everything was down to the genes. Um, and you've got these other uh, uh, lots of other key uh, mutations as well but what you don't see is what's happening underground which is kind of like the cancer metabolism and I kind of liken it to trying to get to Piccadilly Circus if you can't get there one route the cancer cell will just find alternative routes to just come back in and uh, get back to Piccadilly Circus. We know that traditional treatments are not very effective and that they don't wipe out the cancer stem cells so this is chemo will take out the bulk of um, and radiotherapy will take out the bulk of cancer cells but these stem cells are left behind and these then become a resistant tumor and in that mix we know that some of those cells will be glycolytic some actually will be using uh, more oxfos some will be actually consuming lactate which is the byproduct of this fermenting uh, process the glycolysis process some of them become addicted to glutamine some are addicted to cholesterol. And of course, you then have the influence of these genetic mutations, which then affect the metabolism of the cell as well. So going back to this, we then see that uh, in this mix here, you could have that mix of glutamine addicted cells or cholesterol addicted, as well as the glycolytic cells as well. So the point is that you will not wipe out an entire tumor if you just use one approach. You have to use a combination. And we know that traditional medicine is against polypharmacy. So you need to have good quality, safe medicines to add or safe supplements to add. And another reason that a lot of this uh, conflict may be because you've got drug manufacturers who want to just have a hold on the market and they don't want something else being added to their own uh, to their own drug. This is a very interesting demonstration of the difference between uh, temozolomide, which is a brain cancer drug, and metformin. You can see the results for TMZ here. The cancer kill was uh, around 35%, whereas metformin on its own um, actually did better and had a cancer kill of about 40%. However, when you add them together, and this is the key, it's the combination that produces a much better result. Um, so this is what most people know me for is my metro map. And this is a little uh, synopsis of the key metabolic pathways that cancer will use. And I divide it into the sort of the three macros of the diet. So glucose being the carb, uh, the protein is mostly glutamine and then the fatty acids along the bottom. So these are the entry points for um, or, or the points that or the nutrient 
fuel lines, if you like, that cancer will use um, for the glucose. And then you've got some um, protein pathways and fatty acid pathways as well. The glutes, are, these are glucose receptors. Um, insulin, I know uh, Chrissy will talk a lot more about insulin with the COC+. Plus. Um, and of course, you've got the low GI exercise being really important. The lifestyle side is also uh, very key to this. Um, and then underneath all of these pathways, I've actually got the uh, drugs or key supplements that um, either I use or are part of the COC protocol as well. And what we're showing, uh, Professor Lizanti, who I'm sure some of you are familiar with, um, showed that if you block the OxFos pathway in cancer cells, it then uses more glycolysis. And in fact, the other way around as well. So it's a sort of a, um, you block one pathway. And like I said, with my um, analogy to Piccadilly Circus underground, the cancer will just reroute and come in a different route. So the key is to make sure that you're blocking synergistic pathways and different cancers will have different dominant pathways. So you will need to look at which ones are more specific for you. Um, you'll find a lot of uh, uh, that kind of information in the literature in PubMed. Um, so it's well worth doing a little bit of research just to feel confident that you are actually attacking your cancer in the best way possible. I also did a quick synopsis of, of the cancer hallmarks. So I've condensed it down into sort of a five key step process, not entirely straightforward, straightforward process of uh, one to the other. There's lots of interlinks between the two. But essentially, we know that the tumor micro environment is absolutely critical for uh, stimulating the cancer cell. And this is why it then leads. You've got signals that go into the cell and then stimulate this abnormal cell metabolism. This uh, is the uh, metro map. And then it leads to spread and growth. So we've got growth factors and MMP. Um, these are matrix metalloproteinases. These break down the matrix around the cell and allow cancer cells to split off and spread through into the bloodstream. And the, then you get this abnormal immune response where the immune system no longer recognizes the cancer as foreign because it's actually converted some of your normal macrophages into tumor associated macrophages. And these kind of cloak the cancer from being killed off by your immune cell. And this is a result of sort of the lactic acid, which is um, from the glycolysis and also some of these growth factors, particularly transforming growth factor beta and, and VEGF. And this then leads to, because the, the immune system is no longer controlling the cell division, you then get this fast cell division. Very brief. I did go over this in much more detail in my, in my course. But this is um, looking at my cancer markers from when I was diagnosed as stage four. This doesn't go back to 94, but when, because they didn't test them before that, uh, when I was diagnosed uh, with stage four and then had surgery, my markers then shot up to about 600. This is the SCC antigen. It's specific for cervical cancer. Um, and then after chemo, my markers dropped right down. I was having berberine at the same time and quite a few um, supplements as well. And then uh, I sort of potted around. I did lots of intravenous vitamin C. But then when I added aspirin and artemisinin in together, I had a, a, a major drop in my markers there, which was uh, terrific. Unfortunately, we bumped around a little bit more between then and 2004. Um, I also had myelodysplasia. I have another uh, graph which shows what happened um, during that time, but uh, that was pretty scary. And that was when I decided to then include some of these off-label drugs because the diet, the exercise, the supplements, they weren't enough for me. Um, I knew I had to then up my game and then add something a little bit stronger. So dipridamol is um, an antiplatelet drug. And it was shown in the 1980s to have quite a significant effect on uh, blocking the growth of mel melanoma in particular, but um, it also has other effects on the blood as well. And because I'd had this myelodysplasia, I was quite concerned about that. And I thought that would be a good thing to add in. A lot of what I did was sort of gut instinct at the time. I've since worked out why these things worked. Um, but back then I was kind of like a, wish, a little bit of a wish and a prayer 
um, berberine I had investigated. I didn't know anybody else who was taking berberine at the time, but my research had shown me that this was really quite a, what I term a, a big gun. Um, and it's, it's very similar to, to metformin in many respects. The lovastatin and etodilac, I had research and I saw that if you add the two together, the cancer kill was five times more effective than either one of those on their own. So I got, actually got my um, oncologist back then to add that into my protocol, uh, which I don't think you would get these days. Very rare. Um, anyway, back in 2007, I was then in remission. Um, and I decided at this point, having looked at the research into metformin, that this would be a good addition to, um, to my remission protocol. Um, I also took somatidine because my immune system was really rubbish. I didn't know I had cystic fibrosis at the time. But anyway, the metformin has been uh, amazing for my cystic fibrosis. To diagnose that in 2020, just as we um, went into lockdown. So I didn't know. I've had it all my life and I wondered why my immune system was so rubbish. But metformin is actually very antifibrotic as well. So I think it's had huge effects. I've actually reversed a lot of the uh, fibrotic changes I've had in my lungs. So these are some of the things I use in my protocol that were um, very similar to the COC. So metformin. I can show you that it targets quite a few of these pathways. So it targets IGF-1, it targets mTOR, which is like a protein switchboard that sort of triggers the um, division of the cell. Um, dipridamol blocks the nucleoside salvage. It also blocks this p 2 pathway, which is an alternative cholesterol pathway. And actually blocking that can sensitize cells. Linda Penn has done a, a very good study on that that blocking p 2 makes your statin work a lot better. There are natural um, alternatives like luteolin, which can help block the p 2 and delta tocotrienol as well. So this is just an overview of some of the things I did, you know, as well as the lifestyle stuff. I also took DHEA. Um, I didn't take niclosamide or some of these other things, 2DG, DCA, I didn't take those, but um, some of these uh, I did. And then I came across the COC in 2015, having for years tried to get cancer patients to use off-label drugs. So this was uh, a revelation for me that we'd finally got to this point where we actually had a study looking at some of these key drugs. And uh, this was when I set up my Facebook group. Um, and you can see the care oncology, uh, they, they, uh, their cocktail is metformin, atorvastatin, mebendazole, doxycycline, and in some cases, they use flarin, which is uh, also a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. It's ibuprofen in liposomal form. Very similar to my cocktail. So, um, so uh, what I want to state is that there are pleiotropic effects. That means these drugs can target many different pathways at the same time. And this is really key because you don't want to have an enormous cocktail. You want to have drugs that really will have an effect on many of these different pathways and have ideally as few as, uh, as possible in order to achieve what you want. And I think a lot of people throw absolutely everything in, um, but I think really uh, people need to focus on trying to find the key dominant pathways and focus on those predominantly to begin with um, before they add other things in. So this is, if anybody doesn't know my Facebook group, you, you are more than welcome to join so you can find me uh find my group and one of the things that i've been very focused on recently uh with my second edition of my book is ferroptosis and this is using iron as a different way to trigger cell death because apoptosis is kind of becomes um resistant the cancer becomes resistant to apoptosis as it becomes stage three or four and actually triggering a little bit of ferroptosis is uh i think very useful in the coc drugs both the statins and metformin will actually help that enormously. And this is, uh, a, it causes a redox imbalance. So it's uh, you creating free radicals and pro-oxidant uh, environment in the cell. And this is where you have to be a little careful about which antioxidants you use and which pro-oxidants you use in, in, your, uh, in your treatment program at which, which point. You don't have to do a ferroptosis protocol all the time. That, that wouldn't be appropriate, but like a little pulse, a bit like a chemo pulse to try and trigger um, ferroptosis to kill off some of those um, cells. 
So that um, shows it's very useful for uh, triple negative breast cancer. Um, just very quickly to uh, uh, go to an article that came out last week, and I'm just going to pose a question to uh, maybe Dr. Kuhan about this that showed that the metastatic spread of breast cancer accelerates during sleep. This is kind of paradoxical because you'd expect it to be more active during the day. Um, uh, but I don't know whether this is as a result of the clock genes or maybe this is um, the uh, the competition between nutrients of the body and the cancer cell. But I'm suggesting that maybe the use of matrix metalloproteinase inhibitors like mebendazole and doxycycline, um, do you think they should be used at maybe a different time in the day? Um, to, to, for best effects, maybe if we're looking at trying to stop this um, slightly odd effect, which I, I thought was uh, an interesting finding. Fascinating. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, as always, we have to evolve and learn with the, the, the research that comes out. And uh, as you, you well know, I'm sure, Jane, it comes down to the half-life of the drugs. Um, you know, I, you know, I, I'm aware mebendazole has a relatively short half-life. And so, you know, maybe looking at the dosing to kind of ensure that we have it later on in the day, like after lunch or dinner, and obviously try and aid absorption by taking on such things with fats and oils uh, may help that task. And I, I know doxycycline has a, a longer, uh, a longer half-life, and, and I guess we kind of come up to dosing by daily dosing um, in terms of the concentrations in the body, but it's certainly worth considering and discussing for sure. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so it just showed that there were more circulating tumor cells at night and that they're also more aggressive. So um, the, we've had a lot of criticisms. I've seen a lot of criticisms come out recently uh, targeted towards off-label drugs, saying they don't target the tumor microenvironment. I'm um, I, I want to put people right about that because uh, there's inflammation in the tumor microenvironment. There's obviously the glucose, the uh, fats, the protein, all of that will actually stimulate um, uh, cancer. It'll provide an environment for cancer growth. So it does actually affect the tumor microenvironment in many ways, um, as well as mebendazole blocking this hedgehog signaling, uh, statins uh, also blocking the glucose receptor on the surface, um, having an effect on inflammation. I think people don't realize that one of statins main effects is actually to, to reduce inflammation in cancer cells as well. Um, and that metformin doesn't just reduce it in the sort of, it, it reduces this gluconeogenesis, which is in the liver um, and a diet that is very high in carb um, as well as fat will actually create storage in the liver. And if you're going into a starvation or if you're doing a sort of short-term fast, you can release extra uh, glucose from the liver. And one of metformin's jobs is to um, prevent too much sugar release. So I think that's a really important point. Um, and that the doxy and mebendazole will work on the tumor environment as well by blocking these matrix metalloproteinases. Um, so, and, and another one, um, do off-label drugs do more harm than good? I think this is a criticism really more about the prevention of cancer and maybe the use before diagnosis of things like antibiotics and of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, um, rather than actually them being used as treatment. And um, I think this is a slightly unfair comment because uh, you use them in combination, hopefully, when you're using it for treatment rather than um, you know, in a scenario where it may have caused gut dysbiosis or, or a problem in the gut. And I don't know whether you have any comments on, on that as well, uh, Dr. Kuhan. Yeah, of course. Um, so, you know, we, we, we feel such queries quite often. Um, you know, I guess it circulates back around to the nature of the protocol and what we're trying to achieve. Um, the intention is to use a multi-pronged strategy and, in, and, and draw upon the, the ability of the individual components to, as you said, tiotropically affect multiple mechanisms. I mean, you know, doxycycline, for example, the, you know, the topic often comes up and, you know, the role of the doxycycline is primarily really to kill cancer stem cells amongst the other metabolic systems. 
Um, but of course, we're aware that it's, it's an antibiotic. It's not as toxic as the other broad specs like the penicillins. And we use it anyway in real world sort of medicine for longstanding infections and skin infections like acne, rosacea, you know, uh, malaria, COVID-19, recurrent chest infections. Um, in fact, we use it in the chemotherapy world as well in combination with cetuximab or panitumumab for the entirety of regimes used for colorectal cancer. So there is, I guess, is that, you know, there are certain people that lean towards certain fears about the effects of, for example, doxycycline. But uh, what we say certainly is, look, you, you, there's, there's good and the bad, and, and you've got to balance it out. And if we're worried about the microbiome, you know, for example, in our protocol, we pulse the drug. We use it intermittently, month on, month off. We promote use of probiotics in off doxycycline months. Patients are often very well read and engaged maybe with a functional medicine practitioner and consider getting a stool microbiome test to evaluate things and get the actual data. Um, so it's got to be a balancing act of everything. You know, you have to weigh the pros and the cons. And with that set with the other medicines, again, we have a very important sort of safety network in place, regular review of bloods, regular, regular formal review of clinical symptoms um, to kind of catch these issues as they occur, if they occur. Um, but, but you're quite right. I mean, you know, with each of our components, I guess we're quite lucky in that the elements have been very thoroughly researched about and used in clinical practice. So mm -hmm. the test of time has given us that information to sort of be able to reliably prescribe.